Now back to the show. This is The Law Show on CL 650. Did you pay Phil Collins to do that song back in the day? An illegal alien? Well, the Law Show, CL650, Immigration Law. Gordon Maynard and Alex Stoichevich are here from MKS Law. Their website is vancouverlaw.ca. Now, today's show is about express entry. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce, um, the National Chamber of Commerce, I guess you call it, uh, with 450 boards uh, and chambers across the country, boards of trade and chambers of commerce, funded this study about express entry and the pitfalls. And one, Gordon, that you mentioned just before the break, are small businesses. So these are, what, what do you define as a small business in Canada? How many people would be under 50? Well, yeah, no, under 20. Under 20. Yeah. So you've got a probably one HR person that's going to have to stick if handle. If you have an HR or, or, yeah, or, or the owner. Uh, okay, <laughs> well, that's <yeah>. HR. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now that you think of it, yeah, it would be the person that owns the company has got to try and stick handle this. So, yeah. so read that last quote that you read me about a small business owner. Yeah. Canadian Chamber members report that the LMIA process to support temporary workers' entry is almost unusable for most employers, especially small businesses. So in comes MKS law to right. help. Right. And how, how do you help? First of all, managing expectations. Right. Putting this on the real timeline and the real needs of the company so that they can start taking measures to accommodate any needs they have as they go through this process. So it's always managing expectations this is a big one. That's a huge one. Mm -hmm. uh, because, look, the government has misled people. When the government promoted the LMIA reforms, for instance, they said quite clearly that they were going to have expedited applications in certain areas for certain levels of workers, certain salary needs, et cetera, certain kinds of applications for LMIAs, uh, special processing centers. Uh, one of these processing centers uh, was in New Brunswick, is in New Brunswick, and it's supposed to do expedited applications, you know, 10 business days processing, 15 business days. Uh, they sent, a memo has been uh, circulated now, a memo that was internal. A leaked memo, yeah. Yep. And what it said to the processing officers was that when applications come in, if they are incomplete in any manner, even something that can be resolved with a simple phone call to the employer, they should be taken out of the priority stream and put into the regular processing, which now moves it to three to four months processing time. So um, is, this a, is this a black eye on, on Canada? Is this getting out outside of our borders? Are you hearing this? I mean, you were speaking of a, an attorney who lives in uh, Croatia, I think you mentioned. Uh, yeah, and yeah. so is this getting out? Is this in a friendly country for people who want to come to? Well, certainly the problems with, with express entry have gotten out into the world. Absolutely. But there's two people out there. There's the people that do do well under express entry, and there's the people that don't. don't so yeah. you're getting two different sets of messages going out there. I mean, you know, we can't. If you want to be cynical, this is a great time for us. I mean, yeah, uh, it's good business. It's good business. There's court cases where um, they, the absurdity of, listen to this one, court case where they challenged Service Canada because they decided that an ad an employer had was non compliant because it didn't have the employer's full address. Okay. Mm -hmm. It had their email address, their web address, their fax number, their phone number, but it was missing a mailing address, so it was non compliant. Can you imagine in this today's world that right. you need to have I a postal walk, address? Walk down and put my letter in the mailbox. Yeah. You know, I mean, and of course the court agreed, mm -hmm. but the fact that we had to have litigation like this is a product of policy restrictions that are being interpreted in such a way that they're deterring uh, people using the system rather than enhancing it. Yeah, and the internal officers that that work within this system, they're being given directions to be difficult. To be difficult, they will not contact the lawyer. They will not contact the representative. They will contact the employer to discuss the application. And so you need to make sure that that employer understands the application, understands the content, and understands what it is they're asking for, and be prepared to defend it. So they, they'll, get, they'll contact the employer. So you need to brief the Absolutely. owner of the business or the yep. HR person on what to ask and what to do. Sure. But then when they call the employer, they are using ill-trained officers in, on, on, on many occasions, I must say who are looking for ways to say no to the application for what, on very for, tenuous grounds. For what? To what end? Why? The whole idea of putting up, of overhauling the LMIA system was to promote Canadian employment, and that's a good objective. Unfortunately, the means by which they decided to do this was to use a club, 
a club on everything that moved. Mm -hmm. Instead of picking their targets properly and recognizing that in many cases the entry of foreign workers promotes Canadian employment. There are businesses out there that are dependent on foreign workers but in the process will provide jobs to 20 to 30 Canadians. And the system is blind to that. Mm -hmm. The system has taken away discretion. Instead, it's imposed hard and fast rules across the board. And officers who are told not to exercise discretion. I mean, so, and, 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 you know, for clients of ours, that's always a tension, right? So do you open, do you expand your Thai restaurant by bringing in two Thai cooks from Thailand trained in a particular technique that gives them a competitive advantage in Vancouver? Well, you know, says the government, go train them go train those people, send Canadians over there to be trained or, or whatever. But the reality is you bring those two Thai cooks, if the expansion works, you have 10 new waiters and waitresses, you have, you know, uh, sous chefs that you can hire, you know, you have a whole new restaurant and all the spin-offs that are associated with it. And plus you have people who are bringing new skills that they can translate into Canada. Um, it's the same logic as bringing foreign hockey players into the NHL, which the report mentions. If you have a great goalie who happens to be Swedish and you win, you sell more tickets, you create more economic activity. And really, this is, this is true to some extent if you can fill a need with a foreign worker. What kind of businesses are affected the most because of this change? Is it tech? Is it mining? Is it, what is it? Uh, no, it's any business that requires um, a skilled worker, but not a, not a highly skilled worker. Okay. If you have a big business with a particular employee that's a $300,000 a year employee and well-educated, this system is going to be navigatable because mm -hmm. you, you're going to make a case for that individual. But they've drawn the line at a very high level, and if you're below that level, then they're looking for ways to say no to you, and it's harder for you to justify to them why you require the foreign worker, and their own rules are preventing you from having it. For instance, they, they put in rules that if you don't pay the worker a certain level of salary, if you're a dollar below it, then you're under a cap. You're under a cap. You, and, and this year the cap goes to 10%. Only 10% of your workers max can be foreign workers. Now that translates well to some businesses. It does not translate well to all businesses. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a business that it does not translate well to, now you're facing a serious problem. Mm -hmm. Now here's another issue where s certain industries have really been angry, high tech in particular, and video gaming. I was going to say a big part, big thing here is a video game business, right? In so British Columbia. These, these companies go to the trouble of getting sectoral treatment and exemptions from labor market impact assessments for things like advertising and various other things. Um, and from the process altogether, because it's accepted that there's a shortage in their field, okay, or because they're, you know, they, they, they have offices in, in a number of different countries. They've expended time and effort and had the promise of these free trade agreements that would make it easier for people to, to move around. And then are told afterwards, wait a minute, you can't use those same ability for people to get permanent residence. That's, that's what you hear resonate in this, in this report. Interesting. I have a friend of mine who's an executive at a video game company. And um, I always see on Facebook that he's, he's, he's always promoting, hey, we're hiring, we're hiring, hiring. So it's, I think it's easier for them to poach from another video game company than it is to try and bring somebody in from outside well, the country. Well, headhunting is now such a big thing for in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Everybody's out poaching everybody else's mm -hmm. because of, you know. It's harder to bring them in. The challenge That's to right. bring them in. New government, new year, new, new policy, do you think? Uh, it isn't. There's, there's, the things that are discussed here are not on the to-do list of ministers right now. Okay. They weren't put on that list because you think this they had report, percolated up. This Chamber of Commerce report will put it on top of their desk? Well, it will. Now, it takes time to effect. I mean, on one hand, it doesn't take time to effect policy change, and this all is about policy change. But this ship has left port, and it is sailing right now like express entry the way it's constructed and LMIA the way it's constructed and it's going to take some time to slow down that ship and turn it around. But couldn't they just eject that off the ship the M, uh, and, and, well, and they, keep sailing with the could. express entry? They could and I think they will and in fairness to the to the new government there is in the mandate of the new minister there's a number of, of initiatives that do show some promise. One of the things that the, the current government has fixated on is the the old promise of who are going to be our best immigrants? Somebody who's a foreign student who comes to a school in, in British Columbia or in Canada 
they graduate, they get their first job, and there's a facilitative postgraduate work permit available to them where you don't need a labor market impact assessment. Those people are the biggest losers in this because their employer got the benefit of them without having the labor market impact assessment. Already being here, yeah. They are here, they have Canadian education. My God, who could be a better worker long term? And they We're, probably have language skills now. Language oh, yeah. skills, yeah. They, know how to, they know how the transit system works. They're yeah. settled, right? Yeah. Those people get no benefit from the current system. And the government has committed to giving, for that reason, if, if not for the reason that we've mentioned, to try to look at the system so they can give workers on different on work permits that are not this, like la labor market impact assessment supported ones more points. So that is a positive policy uh, uh, announcement that was in their September 30th platform and it was also in the uh, minister's mandate letter sure. on November and, and, 1st. And you're correct. That is something that can be changed relatively, relatively quickly. quickly. Yeah, yeah. What's harder to change? What's harder to change is the LMIA system and the whole mindset of the foreign worker program, which was overhauled and re-implemented and retrained and reset. It's like a, a dog being trained and set loose on its challenge. And now you've got to reel it back. So that's, that's going to be harder to do. You would like to see that the foreign worker program be removed from express entry, treated as a separate silo, it maybe? It, no, it's okay to give credit for LMIA work permits. That's okay. But you can't do it at the expense of not giving credit to the students who have come through the system under post-grad work permits or the intercompany transferees who have come in under NAFTA work permits. Those people have to have an avenue and not depend on an LMIA. They have to be given recognition for what they have. And it's no answer to say to them, go get provincial nomination. So many people have now gone to the provincial nomination program because of how dysfunctional the express entry is that the provincial nomination program had to, had to shut, shut down. shut down because there's too many people that have gone to them. Yep. Well, we've we've talked about it for the best part of an hour here, and uh, we're, we're up against the clock, which is always the case. I'd like to thank our two guests here at the Law Show on CL 650, talking about immigration law. Gordon Maynard, Alex Stojevic, thank you very much for coming in. Your law firm is MKS Law. You're in uh, Yale Town. Uh, you a boutique firm specializing in all of this kind of stuff. So if you have any questions, go to their website. It's very easy to remember, vancouverlaw.ca. Uh, thank you very much, and hopefully in the months to come, we'll have some uh, new answers for these questions. So thanks for your time. In the years to come, maybe. Maybe. The, oh, you, well, you, <laughs> we're dealing with government. <laughs> thank you for your time. You're listening to The Law Show. I'm Zach Spencer. We'll speak to you next time right here on CL650.